Okay, so let me start by thanking the organisers for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to come to the ICTP. And my talk title is Galaxy Clusters as Tele-Alpscopes. And then I'd like to kind of tell you about some work I've been doing with a variety of collaborators over probably the last couple of years now. And let me also um, thank the sponsors, all my people, the people who fund me. But before I start um, properly, I also want to just insert a commercial break. So, uh, so I am writing a popular book on string theory, which is going to be submitted at the end of this week. So I just want to advertise this. It will appear at the end of the year. And so I would like to just advertise this to you all and encourage you all to at least encourage your friends to buy it to give the positive case for string theory and why it should be studied. And having inserted that, I will now return to the main part of the talk. OK, so this is work that I've done over the last couple of years. It involves a variety of topics, um, put by, unified by the idea that string theory is something that is important and what someone should think about possible observational consequences of it and how it can connect to observations. So what's in this talk, we mostly based on things from these papers, which are done with these people. And this is what they look like, in case you want to, some of whom are here, in case you want to offer them a job. And it's all about, basically, try, thinking about axion-like particles and how they can manifest themselves observationally. So you know, although the contents of this talk will be reasonably phenological, you know, at, at heart, I'm a string theorist. So, I want to kind of basically motivate why, in the context of string theory, axion-like particles are something which are good to think about. OK, so you know, if you think that string theory might be actually you know, the one true theory of the world at the smallest possible scales, then you know, in the great tradition of science, one wants to think about how this can manifest its statement could manifest itself observationally. And one approach to this is to try and kind of, you know, get back to the standard model, reproduce the standard model, and think about what might lie beyond the standard model. One difficulty with this is that it's certainly become abundantly clear that there are many, many ways of getting things which look at least approximately like the standard model in string theory. There are many, many different corners of string theory where you can compactify, and it's not at all clear which one would be the right one to, to go down. So if you want to try to get back to the standard model, you are faced with an abundance of, of options, and it's entirely unclear which is the right way to go. So in this respect, my attitude is that it's more useful to think about the most generic features of compactification. The, 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 the facts, things that if the statement that the world has extra dimensions is really a true statement about the world, what are the most generic consequences of this fact? And one of the generic consequences of this fact is that the existence of extra dimensions leads to the existence of, of moduli and axions. So basically gravitationally coupled particles that arise from the geometry of the extra dimensions. Such moduli and axions arise very generic, ge generically. Much of their physics in terms of their effective actions is rather universal across compactifications. And so these represent you know, one of the most natural and universal targets to go for. This talk is going to be about axions. Um, if you read papers on axions, the, the, the nomenclature has become confusing or confused in that the word axion means several different things to several different people. Okay, so the traditional string theory usage is that any particle where there's an exact shift symmetry Basically, theta goes to theta plus 2 pi. You move around in a circle, and you come back to exactly the same point in the Hilbert space is an axiom. There's a more recent usage, which is in the context of monodromy, which is where you have particles that, in a sense, would be axioms um, were it not for some other features of the compactification. And these are... So, so this, these do not have a, a, a fundamental shift symmetry. You move through 2 pi. You are back at a different point in the... Hilbert space, but you know, these still get called axions. And finally, there's the usage which I'm going to really adopt here, which is that 
The word axion, the axion, is reserved for the QCD axion, the particle that solves the strong, C problem, the strong CP problem, and all these other types of particles, particularly the first type of particles that are called axions in string theory, are called axion-like particles. So this is the nomenclature I'm going to adopt here, and the talk is then going to be about axion-like particles. Why to think about them from a morphological point of view? Well, they're fun. Um, they're one of the best motivated ways of extending the standard model. You know, you're moving at 90 degrees to the direction or thinking about, basically, colliders at the TV scale. There's no immediate technological obstructions. You'll get, you can probe the far UV using rather low energy experiments. There's various interesting, uh, interesting hints. You know, so for all these and many others, you know, they're both good and fun things to think about. In terms of the Lagrangian that this talk is basically going to focus about, so this is basically the standard ALP Lagrangian. So what we have here is we have electromagnetism. We have a scalar, the ALP. Um, in principle, so as we're expanding about the minimum of the potential, in principle, there can be a mass term, although in practice, I'm going to treat, treat this as zero. Yeah, so this would complete to a, like a sinusoidal potential, but we're just looking around the minimum here. And then there's the real guts of this, which is the coupling of the ALP to electromagnetism. So this is, of course, a dimension five coupling. So it's suppressed by an explicit mass scale. And this coupling can be rewritten conveniently as basically A, E dot B, suppressed by the mass, by a large mass scale. And just from the outset, so I'm going to basically assume that the out mass is zero in this talk, or that everything I say can go through with a mass, assuming the mass is less than around 10 to the minus 12 electron volts. If you wonder what this scale is, it corresponds to the plasma frequency, i.e. the effective mass of a photon inside galaxy clusters. Um, direct bounds on this coupling basically say that M has to be bigger than around 2 times 10 to the 11, 11 jeff. And beyond that, um, it's basically open. The relevant, the basic the phenomenology of Alps is simple, which is a good thing for a simple person like myself. So it's that Alps convert to photons in coherent magnetic fields. Yeah. If you have a magnetic field which is transverse to the direction of motion of the Alp, there's a finite probability that that Alp will convert to a photon. And in an appropriate small angle limit, this pro conversion probability goes with the square of the magnetic field the square of the coherence length, and inversely with the square of the coupling. So in this game, if you want to win, you want big fields that are coherent over large distances, and obviously you want the coupling to be um, as less, least suppressed as possible. And these basic, simple features determine the, yeah, the phonology of apps. Okay, so this is um, probably a slide that's not that easy to take in, in real time, but um, going beyond the small angle approximation, so there's basically two oscillation angles. The physics of how this is worked out is very similar to that of neutrino oscillations. So there's basically two angles that determine out photon oscillations, one called theta and one called delta. And I've, for kind of typical astrophysical values of the parameters, I've given numerical values for both theta and delta here. The Theta is basically always small, essentially, whereas delta can come out of the small angle regime. Given the physics that what you like is big magnetic fields over big distances, there's really two things which kind of immediately come to your mind. Okay, so one is that you try and go to look for, get very big magnetic fields. And the other thing is to get very big distances. So the very big magnetic fields is... You think, basically, LHC test magnet. So this is the principle of the CAST experiment at CERN, where you have something like an LHC magnet, 10 tesla magnetic field, extending over about 10 meters. You can work out the conversion probability. Astrophysical parameters, you have micro-gauss magnetic fields. So a gauss is 10 to the minus 4 of a tesla, coherent over roughly kiloparsec scales. And if you do the numbers, what you see is, you know, there's no real... I don't have any kind of intuitive thing for seeing this in advance of doing the numbers, but basically, astrophysical sources are overwhelmingly better um, by a factor of something like 10 to the 18. So if you've got something like a relativistic ALP 
or else moving, moving around, then your, the, the conversion probability for out to photon is something like a factor of 10 to the 18 better in something like a galaxy or a galaxy cluster than it is passing through an LHG test magnet. And what this says is that you have, if you're interested in basically the converting outs to photons and the phenology of outs, astrophysical sources are extremely good places to think about this physics. Okay, so then this leads me to the second part of the talk, which is about galaxy clusters. Okay, so as I said, um, I'm a string theorist, and you know, in string theory 101, one thing you're indoctrinated into is the fact that string theory is, the, is a theory of everything, and so as it's a theory of everything, it's in particular a theory of galaxy clusters. So this next talk I want to now, this next part of the talk, I'm now going to discuss the string theory of galaxy clusters. Okay, so here are pretty pictures of some clusters. So these are these are data shaping the Chandra X-ray telescope. So this one is the fam most famous one. This is you recognise immediately as the bullet cluster and the separation of the dark matter with the hot gas. So the distinctive thing of clusters, what you'll see is you'll see the many kind of background galaxies which emit basically optically, and then you'll see the diffuse haze of the hot gas clusters, are about 90% hot glass, and so they emit copiously in X-rays. So clusters are the largest virialized structures in the universe, um, typically about a megaparsec across, 100 to 1,000 galaxies. The baryonic matter is 90% in the gas. The whole cluster is 90% dark matter. And they're suffused by basically this magnetoionic plasma, which has temperatures at the X-ray temperatures, and emits copiously through thermal breadth drive. The point of most relevance to this talk is the fact that this plasma is magnetized. So there's a micro Gauss scale magnetic field that exists throughout clusters. This field is measured empirically through Faraday rotation measurements. And it's got a typical coherence scale or reversal scale of around you know, 1 to 10 kiloparsecs. So you've basically got a region of space which is roughly kind of a megaparsec across and is kind of filled with a micro Gauss magnetic field. And if you're interested in various kind of frontiers of particle physics, so this is really kind of a large magnetic field over large volumes frontier, and this is optimal for the physics of Alps. Okay, so just to make this a little more here, so here's one cluster I'm going to focus on particularly. This is the Coma cluster. So this is quite a famous cluster because it's both kind of reasonably bright, reasonably nearby, about 100 megaparsecs away. So this is it invisible, so you see what you see is all the galaxies. Um, this is it in x-rays, so again, so you see the, basically this characteristic diffuse glow in at x-ray energies. And this is it in gamma rays, so the scale of this is basically 10 degrees by 10 degrees, and the coma cluster itself is a degree by a degree, roughly. So if you look at this central... Um, degree scale roughly there in here, and you can look very hard, and you can keep on looking very, very hard, and you won't see a thing, because clusters have, not, have never been detected in gamma rays. So despite um, original hopes, um, Fermi has, has failed to detect a single cluster, diffuse emission from a single cluster in gamma rays. Okay, so the relevance of clusters to here, to this talk, is the fact that because I've got relatively large magnetic fields over relatively large volumes, they are efficient converters of Alps to photons. And in this respect, the fact that the magnetic field is, you know, a 10 to the minus 4 of a, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 10 of a Tesla is relatively weak, is more than compensated by a coherence length that is expressed in kind of GeV units, particle physics units, is has a numerical value of 10 to the 34, which you then get to put in the numerator of the equation and square. And just looking at the sums, what you see is that if you've got a relativistic ALP with X-ray energies, then it, and it's passing through a cluster, its conversion probability is you know, for coupling values that are something like two orders of magnitude above where the current bounds are, the conversion probability is as large as something like 10 to the minus 3. Now, while that might not sound large, if you convert this to a rate of basically converting energy to light, you'll realize this is a rate of conversion of energy to light which is 1,000 times more efficient than the sun. 
And if you put it like that, you can see that this is then something that you can then seriously think about going to look for and seeing whether you could do something interesting with it. OK, so um, okay, this guy slide is just to scare you and to show you that we did some, did some real work. So what we've, then, what we've done in more detail is then we've looked at basically the best fit models for the magnetic field of the coma cluster, which have been determined by various radio astronomers. And just prop so these propagated out through them. So this is basically a multi-scale Kolmogorov spectrum with it's done on the sort of numerically on a 2,000 cubed grid. And we basically propagated out through this to look at their conversion properties. Okay, so let's just show you the plots. Okay, so um, the impact parameter is just the distance from the center of the cluster here. So what you see is that for sort of X-ray energies, then the conversion probabilities end up is around 10 to the minus 3. So this is for a coupling strength of 10 to the 13 GeV. And then at lower energies, the coupling, the conversion property falls off rather dramatically. Um, I'm not going to particularly focus on this in this talk, but this is something you can understand through looking at the oscillation angles that are involved. So this is one of the first kind of main points I want to make in this talk, um, is that galaxy clusters are very efficient out photon converters. Even for you know, coupling strengths that are you know, up to kind of two or three orders of magnitude belong beyond where the current observation limits are, out photon conversion can be, you know, can be, it can be significant. And which direction is this, I might want to take this in is that it should be clear then that if you have any primary population of Alps, now where that comes from is another question, which, but if you have any primary population of relativistic Alps, you can get quite a significant photon signal, and if you have a significant photon signal, you can see it. And so then in the next part of the talk, I want to basically describe an application of this. Okay, so in our work, we've basically, um, there's been sort of three applications we've been really looking at. So the, the original one, which is kind of the most, sort of, most stringy, which is based on kind of um, oh, I, in fact, the general unit string cosmology, the universe passes through a moduli dominated epoch early in the universe, is the idea that there's a primordial cosmic Alp background which comes from moduli decays at the time of reheating. Um, their decays can produce Alps. The Alps propagate through the universe today. It turns out they have X-ray energies today, and they can convert into photons, and they have the possibility of explaining this long-standing anomaly in the X-ray spectrum of galaxy clusters called the cluster soft excess. Another one where you can take it is by looking, because clusters emit copiously in X-rays, and clusters are also extremely well measured in X-rays, you can actually use basically back photon out conversion to, I think, basically improve the bounds on out parameter space. So that's something we're doing at the moment. But the, the, where I want to take this talk is to think about is the 3.5 kV line, which I'm sure you've all heard of, because this was certainly a very hot topic last year. OK, so uh, to then talk about the 3.5 kV line. So I want to give some basically re observational review and then explain what else may have to do with this. OK, so as I'm sure you know, this story started last year with two papers that appeared on the archive um, within a week or two of each other, one from a group at Harvard, which is this top one, and then one from a group, a mixture of Leiden and Lausanne. And they both reported basically an unidentified line, an X-ray line at energies of approximately 3.5 kV. The first one from basically clusters, and the second one from a mixture of the outskirts of the Perseus cluster, and also from the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, so this is one of the pretty pictures from the NASA publicity shot. So this is the center of the Perseus cluster, and this is showing um, the spectrum with this kind of excess emission around 3.5. OK, so the first thing to say about this is this is a small signal on a large background. It is obviously manifestly obvious that if you look at these plots, you can clearly see the red line going along here, and the blue line, so the blue line is the background. It's completely obvious to see there's a red line here, and this is a success, excess at large statistical significance. Um, yeah, OK, so, OK. Yeah, but we know, you know on these things, we shouldn't really trust our eyes. Yeah, the Higgs discovery is also a small signal on a large background. And what this means is one needs to be careful yeah, and do the statistics carefully and, do the statistics carefully and you know, worry about 
such as background and the various ways you can fake a signal. OK, so what did these original papers have? OK, so the um, most detailed analysis, I think it's fair to say, came in the paper by Bulbulchel. So their main thing was a, they had a stack sample of 73 clusters where they basically stacked the X-ray spectrum of clusters at different redshifts and appro appropriately you know, shifting them back to the rest frame. So there are two instruments on XMM Newton, uh, the MOS and the PN cameras. So they saw the signal with both the MOS and the PN camera basically on all this sample. To check that it wasn't you know, one single anomalous cluster or something throwing the signal, they split it up into the Perseus cluster, the, which is the brightest and the X-ray cluster in the sky, and the combination of Coma and Ophiuchus and Centaurus, which are also three nearby bright clusters, and then all remaining 69. And they found re the signal again in each of these subsamples. For the case of Perseus, where the signal was strongest, they reconfirmed it with deep observations with the archival Chandra observations, both with both the ASIS S and ASIS I cameras on Chandra. In non overlapping observations, the other paper by Boyarski et al., they found the line in the outskirts of the Perseus cluster, whereas the Bulbul observations were at the center of the cluster. So they found it with both, again, the XMM cameras, XMOS and PN. And they also found the line in M31, which is the Andromeda galaxy. OK, so these were the original papers. Um, in terms of significance counting and chi squared per degree of freedom, um, yeah, that's shown here. In terms of things like the look elsewhere effect, OK, so the look elsewhere effect basically means you can cross out any one of these lines. So, you know, you can take, or you can say that, you know, n should be what, two ra ra rather than one. Um, so basically, you know, you can cross out any one of these lines to say that you can find a line somewhere. Um, but when once you've found a line somewhere, obviously that somewhere is fixed, and you know where you should look at everywhere else. So each of these rows is basically independent observations. And what you see is definitely something you know, that means you should pay attention to this. OK. OK. Um, how to evaluate this? So this is my take on this. OK, so it's a plus that is seen by four independent instruments. It's a plus that's seen by two independent collaborations. It's a plus that the collaborations are not solely kind of BSM theorists. Um, why is this? You know, if you're X-ray astronomers, then there's a much higher price to be paid to declaring that you've seen an anomaly, and it might possibly be dark matter, than if you are you know, a theorist. And in particular, you know, if you look at someone like, say, Maxime Markovich, who has written something like you know, 200 papers on X-ray astronomy of galaxy clusters, and then in the 201st paper, you say, well, actually, there's this unidentified line, and I'm willing to speculate about dark matter. It doesn't mean it's right, but it does mean that um, it deserves to have attention paid. So the line's absent in basically some 16 megaseconds of blank sky observations. Okay, what are the negatives? Small signal, it's only 1% above the continuum. There are extra atomic lines at similar energies. There are detector backgrounds. A small wiggle in the effective area, you'd worry might mimic the signal. Yeah, this is countered to some degree by this, but these are certainly things one has, has to be worried about. And in the original paper, you know, due caution was generally um, offered. OK, so since these papers, there's been a variety of work on this topic. So. So basically, um, there's been none observations in dwarf seroidals, stacked galaxies. Um, okay, the Milky Way Center is unclear. There's this series of papers that I commend to anyone who is a connoisseur of the you know, comment on reply on comment on style of scientific writing. And there's also been observations with Suzaku, which is the other main X-ray satellite, which has seen the line in Perseus um, not in Coma, Virgo, or Ophiuchus. And the other comment to make, which is important, which is important for where I'm going, is that the line in Perseus is clearly is strongest in the center of the cluster, and the line in Perseus, and Perseus is a much stronger signal than in other clusters. OK, so in terms of the kind of, you know, the right to interpret this, so the clear first claim belongs to basically models of sterile and neutrino dark matter because these were the only models that were really talking about X-ray lines in advance of the actual observations. Now, why should one not just go with sterile neutrinos? Is that on face value, the data is inconsistent. 
So the sterile neutrino just decays directly to a photon. Um, the parameter in the sterile neutrino model is basically the sine squared 2 theta, which just says basically how fast it decays. And if you look at the numbers in this column, you'll see that basically the strength of the decays are basically incompatible or face value incompatible with dark matter decaying directly to photons. In particular, um, the stack samples of clusters, which give a kind of pretty high, strong determination of this, um, yeah, there's claims, yeah, in the abstract claiming to basically exclude this value of something like 11 sigma through, sta through stacked galaxy observations. Whereas if you look at the Perseus cluster, it is consistently the case that Perseus produces a much stronger signal, and the center of the Perseus cluster even more so, produces a much stronger signal than coming from the stacked samples, and clearly a much stronger signal than anything involving galaxies. Okay, now you can say whether this 11 sigma is really 11 sigma or not, but it's certainly clear that if you take this data at face value, um, dark matter decaying directly to photons is in trouble. Okay, so taking the data at face value, what are the challenges for any BSM explanation? Okay, the first point is that clusters are special. The signal is stronger in clusters than it's in, in galaxies. It hasn't showed up in the stack sample of galaxies. It is present in clusters. There's only one galaxy which has been signal has been observed in, which is Andromeda M31. Yeah, the, okay, the Milky Way Center, I think, is a special case because it's, it's very un unclear what's happening there, and that's a very sort of special region. There's also nearby or cool core or nearby and cool core clusters are special. So cool core clusters are precisely that, where the, cool, the core of the cluster is cool. This just happens over time through radiative cooling. Because the signal is stronger in both the Perseus cluster, which is both nearby and cool core, and it's also stronger in the stacked coma of the Uccas and Centaurus sample than it is in for more distant galaxies, for more, more distant clusters. And why I want to talk about ALPS is I want to focus on an explanation which I think can explain all these features, which is where dark matter decays not directly to a photon, but to an ALP, a, a 3.5 kV ALP, plus something else, so a relativistic ALP with energies of 3.5 kV, followed by ALP photon conversion in the astrophysical magnetic field. Okay, so the basic proposal is then that dark matter decays to a 3.5 kV ALP, and then this 3.5 kV ALP converts to a photon in the magnetic field. So what this basically implies is that the signal will then trace both the dark matter distribution, obviously, and the astrophysical magnetic field. This can then explain this data because, one, well, clusters are special because they're the best out converters in the universe. They're bigger, much bigger than galaxies, but they've got a comparable magnetic field, so their conversion rates are much higher. Nearby clusters are special because telescopes can only look at very small parts of the sky. So pointed at a nearby cluster, the telescope can only fit the steri center of the cluster in its field of view. Cool core clusters such as Perseus are special because both observationally and theoretically, they have much larger magnetic fields at the center of the cluster. So that at the center of the Perseus cluster, the magnetic field might be around, say, 25 micro gauss, whereas a typical cluster magnetic field would be a few micro gauss. And finally, M31 is special because it's an edge-on spiral galaxy and it's with an unusually coherent regular magnetic field. The advantage of being edge-on is that if some dark matter decays in the center of the galaxy, it passes through the disk of the galaxy, so through the entire coherent magnetic field, which then maximizes conversion compared to a face-on decay, where you just come straight out of the plane of the galaxy and don't really see any magnetic field. Okay, so yeah, among clusters, Perseus is special. Ophiuchus, Centaurus, and Coma, these are also nearby, so you only see the central regions. And so again, you can expect stronger signals for these. Um, okay, we can quantify the differences between cool core and non-cool core clusters. So this is my work with Andy Powell, who's in the audience. Um, so I'll just I'll show you some plots as I'm kind of running out of time. So this is non-cool core clusters. So the point to take is basically is a much, cool core clusters have a much higher spike in signal at the center of the cluster because the, they have this spike in the magnetic field. Okay, for the future, one of the fun things about this is there's, you know, there's both lots of data and the data situation is going to get a lot better. So first of all, all these observations have been with archival observations. There's something like 15 years of archival data sitting there and analysis of some of it is in process. For example, Bulbul are currently an analyzing our stacked archival Suzaku observations of galaxy clusters. 
There's also been recently an approval so of a very deep, um, greater than one megasecond XMM Newton observation of the Draco dwarf galaxy. So observation data taking has actually started for this. So there's probably going to be a, a result from the, on this by the end of the year. So this will give a pretty decisive test of the sterile neutrino interpretation of the 3.5 kV line. Um, early next year, Astro H, the next generation X-ray satellite is... Fl- is by the Japanese Space Agency is flying, and this will offer a decisive um, test of the dark matter interpretation of this line. Um, through basically, it will have unprecedented energy resolution for X rays in space. So, this is Astro H. So, this is flying in about six months, so kind of hope, hope it works because, um, yeah, I won't talk about the history of <laughs> microcalorie emissions in space, but let's, let's hope this one works. The SKA is going to also give unprecedented improvements in the ability to determine magnetic fields in clusters, which is, if you're interested in ALPS, is something that will tell you about ALP photon conversion. This is coming online over the next 10 years. And so we've got S Astro H, the SKA, and in the longer term future, Athena has been approved by ESA. So Athena is the next next generation X ray satellite, and that's been approved by ESA for the 2028 large class mission launch slot. So, clues. Clusters are great if you're interested in ALPS. ALP photon conversion is highly efficient in clusters. For the 3.5 kV line, I think this dark matter to ALP to photon scenario is basically a promising and distinctive explanation that can explain the observed morphology. And over the next 1, 10, 20 years, um, there's a variety of new satellites and instruments that are basically guaranteed to be coming on. Thank you. Yes, uh, so you were trying um, in the last part where you were discussing the gamma line. So in the case of, um, of the ALPS explanation, you can explain all the difference in these parameters practically from differences of the magnetic fields, or you have to uh, take it as a free parameter? So, so, so you can explain the fact, that, so the, the fact that the signal is stronger in Perseus than it is in other clusters. You can explain because the magnetic field in the center of Perseus is much larger than typical the typical for, the, for, for M31. So the fact that, um, as it is, you know, it's an it's an edge-on spiral means you'd expect a much stronger signal for M31 than than for, than for typical galaxies. You know, for taking you know, an actual value and saying why is it this as opposed to say a factor of two height, you would need to know the magnetic field very very precisely. So I mean that's that's hard to do. But in terms of say qualitatively, why is the signal stronger here than it is here? That, and, that and what are the perspectives to uh, have a um, better estimate of the magnetic fields? So, so ult- ultimately, SKA, um, depending on kind of, you know, how appealing working out magnetic fields are to the broader astronomical community. So existing radio telescopes could give you better information. It's just a, it's a matter of, you know, are astronomers willing to spend time? How long are they putting pointy telescopes at clusters? Uh, yeah, I have a thing here, related question. So you, you showed us several class, different clusters which have different properties, but for all of them, the line is at 3.5 kV. And your process of ALPS seems to depend on the properties of the cluster, like size, magnetic fields. Yes. And it's an explanation why for, even for different clusters, the line is always at, always at 3.5 kV and not at different energies. So, so the proposal is that the original decay, so that, that this would be coming from dark matter decay, but you would have dark matter decays, instead, so instead of like dark matter decays to a photon plus something else, you would have dark matter decays to an ALP plus something else. So the, the, the fact that the energy of the ALP was 3.5 kV would just be fixed ultimately by what the mass of the dark matter particle is, and this I have, have no prior on. But then, yeah, so the fact it's always that 3.5 kV would come from the, the mass of dark matter. Is there any alternative explanation uh, from uh, particle physics? So, so, so there are some ideas involving um, kind of ex- 
Okay, so there's, there's, all the, there's, there's a huge number of models which are basically dark matter decays directly to photons. And those are just have exact, exactly the same behavior as, as sterile neutrinos. Um, there are some ideas involving basically dark matter kind of bump, bumping together, so-called kind of ec excited dark matter. I mean, I think there's a... I, I don't think they'd be able to provide a reason of, you know, what, say, why, for example, Andromeda would be special as opposed to, to other galaxies, or why... Per Perseus should be so much more stronger than that, 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 than, than other clusters. I mean, they, they, can, they, they, can, they can give, I think, you know, different behavior between... In, 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 they can say broadly why clusters should be stronger than galaxies. I don't think there'd be sort of a, a good explanation for why, you know, say, Perseus is much stronger than other clusters or why M31 is so special among galaxies. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn the speaker again.